Impact Magazine has the pleasure to receive today uh, James Maggot, a writer, uh, but the story uh, started a long time ago. Many people uh, did not hear about the lost children of Sudan, uh, but some because it's been some years ago. So today, um, what can you tell those who didn't hear about this? Well, the story of Lost Boys is a unique story. Um, the Lost Boys of Sudan, we call the Lost Boys of Sudan uh, because when the war broke out in our home back in 1983, most of us were young, very young. Uh, when the war broke out, I was only three years old. And um, years later, the war continued, which killed a lot of family members in our uh, villages, our cities, include my father, it's a part of it, a lot of my brothers, and a lot of my family members have lost their lives, so did the rest of the lost boys. Some of them lost their fam families completely. And um, we become orphan children, most of us become orphan children, and the world puts us out to the direction of the eastern part, just crossing the desert toward Ethiopia. We were following the people who have been to Ethiopia before, so we don't even know where we are going exactly. But thank God, we, most, we managed to cross the big desert of Africa, the Sahara Desert to Ethiopia. And even crossing it, a lot of us lost their life due to the lack of water, food, and uh, animals, attacks, hyena, lions, you name it. And so, and we just, most of us were working bare feet. And some of us done a closer up because we were just kids. And when we end up in two different refugee camp in Ethiopia. One of them is Dima, where I'm from, uh, D-I-M-M-A. Uh, that's where I end up to, in the border to Kenya, somewhere between mountain, between Kenya and Ethiopia. And most of, some of them end up in a city called uh, Panyendo. And so that's how we live in Ethiopia. And we live in Ethiopia for a while. We were trained as boy soldiers. That's how we get military training, most of us, or all of us actually. And because you have to be trained as a soldier before you go to school for one year. And so that's how John Grant made it at his time and Selpa Kiev, the current president of Southern Sudan. How old um, were you when you became soldier? When I arrived in Ethiopia, I was seven years old. And I had my brother who was 16 years old that assigned to me, James. And unfortunately, uh, James and I died by a car accident here in Lancaster a couple of years earlier when we got here. But yeah, um, by the time, surely I spent a year as just a civilian because crossing the desert was a tough journey. It took us, it took some of us far, far uh, north, uh, six months to get to Ethiopia. It took me and people from my area three months to get to Ethiopia, walking. Three months walking. Yeah. And so by the time we get to Ethiopia, we were weak, we were skinny, there's no food. Like the Ethiopian government, the UN took us in, they, they worked with the Ethiopian government, they actually admitted us in the hospital. And we have, like somebody like me, I spent over, I think, seven months in the hospital, just being treated. And then when you are released there, you are released the SPLA to the government, Southern Sudan. And soon as soon as you release to them, they take you right away to the military training. They don't give it a second thought because mm -hmm. you are healthy now. And so that, um, yeah, uh, from age of eight to nine, I was fully in a training. Uh, trained, I don't know, weapon, and you name it, just military life. Uh, we were isolated from families. We're not allowed to go to where the families are. Like now, I have family, you have family. Our mm -hmm. children are completely cut off. There is a, we have a base where we stay, and in that base, there's a military police between us and the and the cities, like where the families are. So if you cross there, the military police will scan you like a snake, like a snake from that point of view where they see you back to your um, squad or your test force. And then again, your soldier will punish you in different ways. <laughs> like it just become a big chaos. So 
they literally tell us you're not allowed to go to the village. I mean, you're not allowed to go to the city. This is where you stay. This is where you go to school. This is where, I mean, this is where you are being trained as a soldier. And even after the training of the military is done, we are mixed and de isolated by age group. Were you obliged uh, to do that, or uh, it is something you had a pleasure in it? I have no choice in matter. I have to do it. Me and my age mate, I don't have a choice in matter. Mm -hmm. It's as long as a boy, I'm a boy. I have to do it. It's not something that uh, you 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 make choice of. It's yeah. you have no over control. Uh, you have no control over it. But did you feel some kind of pleasure playing with weapons and things like that? Of course, we kids don't like it. I, I doesn't love to, to play with the being given AK-47. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, there's, time, there's time that we can be kids sometimes. Um, but now it's different. That's a real thing. That's a weapon with bullets, the real ones. Well, at this point, when we were in training, before we were, while we were training, we have guns that we use during the day, but they don't have weapons. I mean, they don't have a bullet in them. Okay. They keep the bullet away. Mm -hmm. And we, we are people who, our trainers are, held, are older than us, so they look over us. But um, we're not allowed to use live bullets. We're not allowed to use bullet at all. Mm -hmm. By the time the sun, three o'clock, we have to take those guns back to the storage. And now you walk around with the woods and you pretend that wood is your gun. You have to carry it like the same way you carry the yellow guns. Mm -hmm. And so that's how, we, that's how we, we were living our life. But yes, we enjoy playing with, uh, years later, even years later, like 1991, when the Ethiopian government have war of their own and they kick us out of Ethiopia. That when we know that uh, we now become men. Um, now I'm 11 years old, gone 12, and like my son here. So now this time they have to give us really guns with the real life bullets and roadside bombs. Like those small roadside bombs we plant on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to carry those with us too, back to Sudan, because the Southern Sudan government did not they did not want the Ethiopian government to overtake them, and so they belong to them, and we are the one who have to carry them out of the country of Ethiopia, and that one, and then the Ethiopian government um, are fighting of their own, and they try to attack us, and John Grant now at this point said, okay, this war is not ours, so when you see the Ethiopian soldiers chasing after you. Turn the barrel of the gun forward, hold the barrel of the gun forward, and hold the back of the gun backward so, so they can see that you are not a threat to them and keep running that way. And that's how we did it. <laughs> But it still did not stop them. Some of us were, the thing they're grown, and some of us just afraid. And when they mm -hmm. turn the bullet and shoot them, they, the good thing about the Ethiopian military back then, uh, I think they killed few, but most of them, they just wounded them. Mm -hmm and come and take them back to Ethiopia to treat them. What did you feel like seeing for the first time someone uh, falling down, killed by a bullet? <sighs> um, when you see somebody being killed, it's not, I don't think that's a good way to describe it. It's a mixed feeling. You are shocked in the, at first, you are shocked. You can't believe that person just died or that just happened. That or uh, sometime you have questioned that could have been me. Um, and then uh, you have this friend that you know for years and you're not going to see and he was just a kid like you. Mm -hmm. um, and years later, there's now I, I grew up, there's so many aspects that I can see that if we would have done it like this, I think most of us would, would have survived this. But it wasn't just um, Ethiopian government shooting us, running across the uh, the river Nile, um, there are, I mean, there are um, crocodiles in the river. And the river too, that time was a raining season in May. So the water, the water coming down from the mountain and the water was rising. And majority of us did not know how to swim. Some of us were lucky. The majority of us did not know how to swim. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were so many against us. People drowning because they don't know how to swim. Crocodile is taking them. And then the bullets are being fired um, among yourself, and it, it, it's it's a chaos. It was a chaos. 1991. It's not. It's not a good feeling at all. And then when we across 
to southern Sudan and we live in a town called Pakok and where the rest of the guys were living in a town called Pachala. Uh, hmm. Now we have to face the anger. We stayed for seven months without food. We're eating leaf. There's one, over 1,000 people as a task force. Um, they, they, they give them, uh, they give us a cow a day, the government of cattle that they take from some different villages and they give us a cow a week, I mean. They give a cow to over 1,000 people to eat that cow and distribute among them a squad by squad. Uh, so we can eat that meat for one cow for a whole week. I, how one cow gonna feed people or over 1,000 people for a whole week? Unbelievable. And so yes, that those are we were facing so many things. That year was what well, the the UN tried to get to us, the UNICEF, the World Vision, the Red Cross. Uh, they tried to get to us, but they tried to come crossing the half of part of the desert, cross over to where we had. But the problem is the the, the road, you know, Africa road, the road were muddy. Mm -hmm. So the the vehicles, the trucks stuck along the way. I will just say God chose to keep me alive this long mm -hmm. because I I still don't know my purpose why I'm still alive. There are people who die like my brother just di uh, died uh, shortly after a year we came to America, James mm -hmm. too. Over the years I asked God why 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 are you keeping me alive? Because he's older than me. I know you could have done more. It took me a few years after he, he's dead for me to give up Charlie's stuff and try to be a man and grown up mentally and you know even though i thought i was already grown up because he was around me i did not realize that i was still a kid because he shielded me from all these horrible things over mm -hmm. the years um when he died i was 20 something years old but yes when i was 23 um came here we came here in america there is a time that after we came to america there's a time that um, I go hang out with my friend, I go to school and I come and then go to work. I go to work, I go to school and then go to work. And then come back on weekend, I hang out with my friend, which are Sudanese, they're still here, uh, Lost Boys too. And um, I came home, my, my brother bought me those small phone back, back then there's no this high technology that we have today. Mm -hmm. I don't I have my spring phone, I still have. And so, um, there's a time that he'd be calling me and using the minute. It's expensive back then. It just take a minute like that. And so um, he expect me to pick up my phone every time he called me because he had that power over me culturally, according to yeah. our African culture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm just busy playing soccer or playing basketball or running. I love to run. And I, I don't pick up the phone. My phone might be on silent or in the back somewhere on the side of the, on the grass while I'm playing. And then when I get home, like like winter time now, five o'clock, it's already dark by six, seven o'clock, I got home. He's sitting in the living room with the light off. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just came in and I just want to go up to, this, uh, up to the stairs and then he turned on the light. I want to go to my room, he turned on the light and say, come here. So I came, sit, I sit down. Where were you? Why don't you pick up your phone? What were you doing? Were you doing drugs? Were you drinking? All this, <laughs> like, look at me. I don't drink. So I don't, don't smoke. What, what do you want from me? I was just playing. Mm -hmm. Did you do your like, you know, culturally? So I, I, I think that make me wonder sometimes why God keep me this long. I'm 40 years old now. Why did He keep me this long? And what is my purpose? Maybe God okay. keep you this long to tell the story. Maybe that's it. Shooting yes. us, running across the uh, the river Nile. Um, there are, I mean, there are um, crocodiles in the river. And the river too, that time was a raining season in May. So the water, the water coming down from the mountain and the water was rising. And majority of us did not know how to swim. Some of us were lucky. The majority of us did not know how to swim. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were so many against us. 
people drowning because they do not swim, crocodile is taking them, and then the bullets are being fired um, among yourself, and it, it's, it's a chaos. It was a chaos, 1991. It's not, it's not a good feeling at all. And then when we are crossed to Southern Sudan, and we live in a town called Pakok, and where the rest of the guys were living in a town called Pachala. Uh, hmm. Now we have to face the anger. We stayed for seven months without food. We're eating leaf. There's one, over 1,000 people as a task force. Um, they, they, they give them, uh, they give us a cow a day, the government of cattle that they take from some different villages. And they give us a cow a week, I mean, they give a cow to over 1,000 people to eat that cow and distribute among them a squad by squad. Uh, so we can eat that meat for one cow for a whole week. I, how one cow gonna feed people or over 1,000 people for a whole week? Unbelievable. And so yes, that those are we were facing so many things that he, and then come back on weekend and hang out with my friend, which are Sudanese. They are still here, uh, Lost Boys too. And um, I came home. My my brother bought me those small phone back back then. There's no this high technology that we have today. Mm -hmm. I don't. I have my spring phone. I still have. And so um, there's a time that he'd be calling me and using the minute. It's expensive back then. It just take him like that. And so um, he expect me to pick up my phone every time he called me because he had that power over me culturally, according yeah. to our African culture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm just busy playing soccer, or playing basketball or running. I love to run. And I, I don't pick up the phone. My phone might be on silent or in the back somewhere on the side of the, on the grass while I'm playing. And then when I get home, like, like winter time now, Five o'clock, it's already dark by six, seven o'clock. I got home. He's sitting in the living room with the light off. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just came in and I just want to go up to, this, uh, up to the stairs. And then he turned on the light. I want to go to my room. He turned on the light and say, come here. So I can sit. I sit down. Where were you? Why don't you pick up your phone? What were you doing? Were you doing drugs? Were you drinking? All this, <laughs> like, look at me. I don't drink, so I don't, don't smoke. What, what do you want from me? I was just playing. Mm -hmm. Did you do your, like, you know, culturally? So I, I, I think that make me wonder sometime why God keep me this long. I'm 40 years old now. Why did he keep me this long? And what is my purpose? Maybe God keep you this long to tell the story. Maybe that's it, yes. So tell us, were you uh, brainwashed this camp? And how did you get out of that to become the normal person you are today? I don't know about normal person that I am. Uh, how did I become? Because the more thing is that, is that's why I'm writing a children's book. Even though there were a lot of bad things happened to us, being boy soldiers and all that, there was places that we were born in. Like when I was born in back home, I had a good life. Mm -hmm. Came from a great family. Um, from the city to the village, I, I have a great family. My mom, my dad, my brother and sisters, my aunt, my uncle, the I have a wonderful family. They're still there, most of them. Uh, my mom's still alive, even though my dad was killed yeah. during the war. But um, when we left home and become boy soldiers and live all this type of life, there's one thing that we also do. There's time, there's that window that we can just become children. Running around, playing. It can be raining. I remember those days, it's raining so hard while we are in the military. Uh, a base and we are just a bunch of boys who strip down naked and running outside in the rain <laughs> and start dancing in the rain and just kids and wrestling in the lane in the rain or or uh play soccer that we make out of the hand gloves now we blow it up and wrap it up with the we rip up shirt and 
wrap it up and we play in the rain with it. So there are times that we can be just happy kids. Mm-hmm. And um, until the military police show up <laughs> and start beating us back into the houses, because they say, you guys going to get sick because it's when he, he gets sick, we don't want him to be sick. And they just chase us back into the mm-hmm. houses and that stuff. We don't get arrested. They just skin us right in the field. We run back in. So who called but, you for the first time with the lost the children of Sudan? Before we become lost boys, we have so many different names we were called. We were called uh, Jesh al Amr, which means the Red Army. That's what our name by Arabic translation, the Red Army. Mm-hmm. That's what they used to call us as young boys. That's our soldiers. And then when we came to Kenya, they changed it from that Jesh al Amr is still there. We still call each other that, but even now, but it changed from that to minus. So we become minors. Mm-hmm. And then when the American accept us to come to America, and then they look at our story from where we came from and what happened to us as kids and our families, that when they came up with the name Lost Boys of Spain. Some kind of nostalgia uh, about that period of time in the desert, or something you've been missing uh, from that period? One thing I would like to, that's, that's the reason I'm trying everything that I can to tell my story in mm-hmm. any way I want. Um, either write a book or part of it, make a movie. Um, I'm trying to tell that story so I can make enough money and be able to go back. Because I'm one of the few 5,000, over 5,000 that are lucky to come to America's lost boy. There are most of us are still in the same refugee camp in Kenya, where we came from in Kakuma. Yeah. I, I, I would love to go back to Kakuma. I would love to trade my, my foot back from Kakuma yeah. all the way back to Ethiopia, and then from Ethiopia to see exactly how long will it take me by vehicle from Ethiopia back to my hometown where I left in the first place. I would love to do that. Today, the book is out there. It's a cartoonistic book where you talk about this life of yours. So can you tell us a little bit about this book? What are you trying to achieve with this book? And what are you really telling us in this book? Everything in my life is personal. And this book is very personal. This book came up because of my children. Mm -hmm. Without, if I did not have children, I don't think if I would even write it. um, is the story, the story of Riyak is the story, which is my middle name, James Riyak, is the story that I used to tell myself, the way I look at things. My mom used to say that the room can be really dark, but in that darkness, there's a small light coming somewhere in that part of the house. It doesn't matter how dark it's outside, follow the light. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, how how tiny it is, follow that light. It might might turn out to be a big open light sooner Mm -hmm. or later. And that's what I did with my story, with the book. That's what I'm doing with with the book. It's the story of Iyak, my story about the book is the story I used to tell myself to escape all those horrible things that happened in my life, horrible things that I've seen or done as a boy, soldier. Um, A lot of my friends losing life, um, including my loved one. Uh, so th- that book, I'm using it to tell the positive part, the light part of it, the thing that I used to love about uh, about my life when I was little. And it came out because of my children. Now, the reason I say it came out because of my children, when my oldest child was born, James, back in 2008, is something that I just told. I never wrote it down. I was back in college back then, and I just told my child. And as you know, my children are half white. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. his mom, his mom kind of liked this story a lot. And she herself, because I tell it in English. I sometimes I tell it in Dinka, my native language, and then mm-hmm. translate it into English. So and then she get to learn the story by heart. She always sit there. She be sitting next to me and we all fall asleep by me. They, her and the kid, the child fall asleep by me telling the story. 
Wow. And so years later, uh, uh, 2010, um, we were still in college, and she had a class assignment about the cultural, uh, different cultures. And she knew the, the, the story by heart. So she wrote it as a class assignment. She did not even ask me. She just write it down as a class assignment. Mm -hmm. And a professor, a professor at the community college loved it so much. Uh, she said, I need to meet this guy. And so she, she come and told me she got, she's supposed to get an A plus, but she did not have my permission to write the story. So she got an A. And, but the professor still said, go and bring your husband to come and speak in front of the class. Interesting, yeah. Yes, and so I was already in that school too. Mm -hmm. And so she just told me, so I said, yeah, my, my period, I'll come and talk in front of your class. Mm -hmm. And she was studying social work. And so I went there and I'm studying electronic engineer. So I went to her class and speak in front of the class. And everybody was so happy. And the teacher was hacking me, which my wife said, uh, she, she hacked you so much, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she's European. She's European. She's an older woman. But um that from that day on, after that, when I speak in front of the class, that one I'm like, okay, I think I need to put this down on a piece of paper mm -hmm. in my own. And that when I took upon myself and start and start writing about it. And then my second child was born, so I'm reading the same story. Word well, I don't read it, it's in my head, I just tell it. Yeah, but she, so. I am not she have it in her hand, and when I'm not home, like when I work late sometime, she um, she put the kid to bed, then she can tell it, she can read it from the mm -hmm. from the what I read because I wrote it down and typed it up. How the kids are taking that? How do they feel about it? They love it, my children still love it until this day. Um, they love the fact that, um it's a very unique story and they love the fact that it's direct story from the dad. Yeah. It's a true story about the dad. And um, on top of that, um, we, I used, I, sometimes I don't just read them my story all the time. I, I read them American book, the, the picture book, all the mm -hmm. children that's here. I wrote those, I read them, to, uh, I read them those books and their mom too, but they will never fall asleep with, with they will never fall asleep with this, without a story of the act of the story, another story I told, a story of a frog, a boy with a frog, a very unique story too. Uh, yeah, uh, I, of the story of some different story, but I, those are the stories I grew up with, but I translate them back into English and tell them in English, mm -hmm. which I did not write them down all yet. I just write the story of the true story about me. I say story, point. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very unique thing about it, the fact that I came back to my children again is this, now I'm not with their mother anymore. We, we are being self separated now for a few years, divorced for a few years now. And I see my children struggling between cultures, between the white culture or the yeah. Western world, culture, the American culture and my culture as yeah. an African. And so that what make me want to publish this book because I, I personally struggle, when I came here, I'm struggling with American way of doing things. It's a culture mm -hmm. shock for me. Mm -hmm. And you yourself, should, you, you know that too. Yeah. Uh, because this is, it's very hard to come from different, completely culture way of doing things and then come to this culture and they want you to do things according to their way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Now you have to learn, literally, you have to learn from start up forward. Mm -hmm. But you can still balance it. Yes, and that's what, that what I did. Like for me, it took me years, as you know, I lived here for 20 years. It took me years to be able to balance it out yeah. and get to the point where I accept both both cultures, the yes. American culture and the Africa, mm -hmm. and the Africa culture. Yeah, I love those places equally. I I love the fact that when I'm going to Africa and they back home, they tell me welcome home. That when I came back from home, back from home, <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, but how do you put those two cultures together? And are you talking about these two cultures in your book uh, uh, also? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm talking about these two cultures. Um, that's a good question. I'm trying, uh, what I'm doing, I'm using my experience, mm -hmm. my knowledge in this country as a person lived here in America for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then as a person who have children who are born 
half white and half African. Yes. And sometimes my children have been taught in school that American culture is better than yeah. African culture. Mm -hmm. When my children come home, I'm teaching my children say there's no such a thing as American culture is better than African mm -hmm. culture. Is I always tell my kid, learn it, learn both cultures, learn both languages, because it will never hurt you. Mm -hmm. he said, I told them, Daddy, you have a very unique culture, very powerful culture. Africa culture is the best culture ever. Then when I say that, my older son like, Dad, didn't he just say, there's no better culture than other culture? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. say, yes, this time I contradict myself. It depends on the subject. It mm -hmm. depends on what you guys are talking about, what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Because when they come home to the parent, like you, myself, we try to teach them African culture, but they go back to the mom and the have white side of the family to come to my case, my children, or school, they have been taught about everything else but American yes. culture. Yeah. That's confusing. That, that's very hard to struggle with. And I see a lot of children across America and the world, mixed children, mm -hmm. and children of immigrants, like yourself, myself, that are struggling, especially the African children, that are struggling with these two different parts of the world that they live in. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to tell my children by telling the two stories or two cultures is the fact that daddy also struggle with these people. Mm -hmm. Now I'm putting down in the book, I'm putting all this in the book by telling them, yes, I also live the same life. So there's no bad culture. They're all unique in their own way and they're great in their own way. Mm -hmm. They're bad thing about every culture and they're good thing about every, every culture. Just like there are bad people everywhere you go in the world and there are great people everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. so, and so that's what I'm trying to tackle, that's what I'm tackling in the book based on my experience. And I want to pass it down. Even though it's, 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 uh, the book is called The Story of Iyak, which is my middle name. It actually um, dedicated to my children. Are your readers uh, receiving this book um, with the same enthusiasm um, about those two cultures? Do you think they get it uh, uh, through this book? The thesis that so far that I being set out as the main idea for the book, what's going to end up in the book? Mm -hmm. I know by the time the book is published, they will love it. Because I'm trying to write this book for every child across America mm -hmm. and every parent, like, every child across America to be able to love it. And every parent, when they read it to their children, uh, immigrant children, uh, parents like myself uh, and you, to be able to read it and relate to, uh, relate to it. Mm -hmm. Because we all have a story to tell. So I want to tell this story, not just as a story of the struggle child from East Africa, in Africa, on the continent of Africa, or Southern Sudanese child who struggled. No, I want to tell this as an African story a true story about an African child that came and lived in this part of the world, in, in the Western world, in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That's how I want to read it, because there's, there's good thing can happen to it, but if I told it right, which I know I'm going to, and I have like my illustrator that I told you about, Tess, and great people that helped me, people like Matt Johnson, uh, David Gooden, and his wife, um, they're, they're behind me, and a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. that give up, they give up their time and every time they give up their time to advise me and work with me and help me. So I, I'm trying to tell this as a story of an African child. So the people who doesn't know about the struggle of African, they had before they came here. Now can learn about them. They can teach their children about that struggle. Because everybody knows, yeah, there's war in Africa. The people are starving in Africa, but that's not true. There's also great things. Though that, I mean, it's true in a way, but there are other great things on, in Africa. There are rich people. There are billionaire people in Africa. Mm -hmm. There are people that are road in Africa. There are toll building in Africa. There are cars in Africa. There are manufacturers in Africa. The land is vast. It's the richest land on the planet Earth. So that's, that's the story. Those are the things that I wanted to point out in the, in the book, in the children book, because why? The grown up mind already have different mindset. Yeah. But I want to capture the younger mind of children mm -hmm. 
to take that mentality out the growing up by looking at Africa in a different way. Uh, you've been working with uh, someone who's drawing. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about this partnership? Yes, uh, <laughs> she's great. She's great. Um, her name is Tess. Tess, Tess is uh, she is a uh, illustrator. Uh, she likes to draw, like doing the the cartoonic cartoonic yeah. part, of it. and uh, she's a writer too. So she is very good at what she do. She is she's she's phenomenal. When is the she's book phenomenal. coming out exactly? Well, right now we are raising fun. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing right now, that why I was on news is um, to raise the fun and be, I, I'm I'm not going to the small publisher. And I'm not publishing this by myself. We don't know what we're doing. I'm mm -hmm. going for the highest publishers, like the main, the best publisher I can find. And that way the money going, mm -hmm. going, going to go to, to go to that company to publish the book. And also for me to get paid. And so I don't have to go to work and be able to do both things. I want to be able to focus on the book so it can come out quickly. Mm -hmm. So, and also the people like, as I said, the people I'm working with, the crew I'm working with, uh, they take their time off work so they can come and work with me. I also want them to get paid for their time. My aim, I have a few things that I need to point out to keep in mind when you read this book. Um, number one, all these refugees people you see came from elsewhere in the world mm -hmm. to America have a story to tell. They live amongst American people, and American people just think that they came here to destroy, destroy this country, but their aim is to come here to get a better life, just like the, the refugee before us. Mm -hmm. But every refugee came here before us or after us have a struggle, have a story to tell. They have been struggled before they get here. Mm -hmm. And as you asked me earlier a question, how did you overcome all this? It's up to individual. Mm -hmm. Like when we came here, we carry ourselves the best way, the same way we used to carry ourselves back home. So we have so much to overcome. American people don't know that. So I'm here to teach them the thing that we deal with in our daily life. Mm -hmm. Even when we're living in America, we still have the rest of the families overseas mm -hmm. that are struggling. Yeah. And we have to work hard to send them money. But even that, we are still happy. And we are focused on our families over here too. And we are just like everybody else in the world. But it's the cultural things. I'm trying to teach the African way of doing things to the children mm -hmm. from the start up. That's the most important part. It came down to the children that every child, whether they are born African or not, need to learn about African struggling, this boy came as, was as a struggle boy, and now over the years he saw a lot of things, but he grew to be a man. And even after he grew to be a man, he keep in mind his struggle that he had. He did not forget, but he's still living a good life among the society in the Western world. And he see the struggle in his own children, that his children, when he see that struggle in his own children, who are half mixed, half white and half African, and get seem to be caught between hot rocks of two different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And though they love both parents so much and love my love those places so much, the dad is keeping in mind that I want to know I struggle like that one upon a time. Don't give up. Be happy. Embrace yourself. Love yourself. If you love yourself, everybody will love you. If you love yourself, guess you can love both cultures. You always embrace both cultures and you can take a step from there forward and you turn out someday to be a great person because why the children there's no bad child there will be never a bad child there's no child born bad True. the parent is the bad one and what you teach the child will make the child bad or good and so i'm trying to teach the kid to be good interesting everybody has a story to tell james maggot